Well, peace, grace, and good morning to you. Yeah. How many of you are beehive packers? You know what a beehive packer is? Beehive packer is the person that has a compartment in a suitcase for everything. Now, my wife is a beehive packer. Okay? I'm more of a bird nest packer. I just... So, you know, we, we travel a lot and we go overseas and uh, when, when we come back, we always seem to have more stuff than when we left. For some reason it grows. And um, what happens, she says to me, she says, Baba, look, there's all that stuff, but we can't put it in the suitcase because the suitcase is full. And I grin and I say, ain't nothing full as long as I'm around. And it goes in there, and it crams, and I sit, and I push, and I shove, and I do, until eventually it zips up. Now, if you are a beehive packer, you have all little compartments for your thing. But you'll never, never enjoy the beauty of a full suitcase. There's something divine about a full suitcase. And Jesus in Matthew 5 and verse 17, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophet, I came to fulfill it. And that word for destroy in the original Greek is the, is the word katalizio, which means to loosen. In other words, basically what he said, I didn't come to release you from the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill what you were supposed to do. And in that word fulfilled, there's this understanding of cramming something. Remember in John 10, 10, when he said, I came that you may have life, and a life crammed with everything, with goodness. You see, it's not just the little bit here and a little bit there. And this morning, I want to talk to you about, we, st we started a, a, a couple of months ago, I can't remember anymore. But a couple of months ago, we started a series on the, on the Magnificent Ten, the Ten Commandments. And uh, I, as, as you might know, I am a grace preacher. I eat grace, I drink praise, I, I breathe praise, uh, grace, I live grace. I believe that if it wasn't for grace, there wouldn't be a universe. And because of that, my whole life, revolves around this concept of Jesus having taken my place. Now, what is the, how can I take that and zoom in on the Ten Commandments and find grace in there? Well, we're going to have a look at that because uh, that is actually the cramming of God's personality into something that he gives to his people so that they may have a full life, a crammed suitcase full of life. So, please pray with me. Daddy God, thank you for everything. I love you so much, Lord. Thank you for, for the praise and worship this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your smile while we were singing. Thank you for the angels that joined in. Thank you for the, 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 the windows of heaven that opened and, and showed us things prophetically. Thank you for everything, Lord, but most of all, Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your love. Thank you for what you've done. I'm asking you, Daddy God, this morning that we will not just have a bunch of information and a, and a series of steps and a, and, a, and a number of things to do, but that somehow, Lord, you will use what I'm going to say and, say and reveal things to your people, to these precious ones that have come this morning to drink from the fountain of living water. And, Lord, I thank you for it. Amen. And by the way, Lord, thank you that Italy scored eight points. Amen. And didn't go nil. Amen. Okay, the, te the Magnificent Ten. They found uh, in, in Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 through 17. Now, the word commandment is actually a very arbitrary word that is used by the translators. Because the, 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 the way that the Bible is written, it says that actually the ten words. Actually, uh, this, is, go, this is the 
this is what it says. It says, and God spoke all these words saying. And the, the word translated commandment, because we have this idea that somehow in order to please God, we have to obey his commandments. No, in order to please God, we have to believe him. It is impossible to please God aside by faith. So, uh, the Bible says, God spoke all these words saying, and now I'm going to try somehow and take this and kind of work it into a series like we started number one. Now today we're going to handle number two and judge by the frequency of my preaching, most probably we're going to end up in 2016. But nevertheless, you stay tuned because it's going to bless you. And one day we're going to have it in a, in a nice folder and we're going to be able to give it out. But the word that starts off this whole thing called the Ten Commandments is the word, word. God gave words. And in that word, we find the concept of grace immediately. We, uh, last time we, we, we looked at this, we saw that uh, in the first word of the Bible, in the beginning, Brishit, in the beginning, we saw that in that word, contained within that word, it was the whole gospel. In the beginning, the Father and the Son concluded the work of the covenant all contained in the translation of that word. The same way we're looking at this word, and it's the word Dabar. Now, Dabar is made out of three letters, Resh, Beth, and Dalit. The, uh, the, the, the Hebrew doesn't have any vowels, but it draws vowels from the meaning of the, of the word and from the proximity of the different letters. It's complicated, but don't worry, I don't know it either. You're gonna, you can go to heaven without knowing that, so it's cool. But... Uh, uh, Davar is actually Resh, R, Beth, B, and uh, Daleth, D. Now, uh, Resh and Beth, R and B, are actually uh, the house, the man of the house. Uh, Resh is, the, is man, it's, it's represented by, it's the head of a, uh, of a human, it's the head of a man, and Beth is a house. You remember the word Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem, house of bread. Beth is always, uh, uh, represents a house. And it's, it's, it's because the Jews came out of Egypt where they learned how to write and they learned how to, the Egyptians wrote, with hieroglyphics, with little pictures. So every picture, every letter has a picture and every word is like a storyboard. Okay, like a comic strip. It says something. It's a, one, a word tells you a story. That's where revelation is contained. If you just read the word, you will never get revelation. You have to read what's inside the word. Okay? Now, R and Beth, the man of the house, is the son. You remember the word Bar? Blessed are you, Samon? Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. The word Bar doesn't mean a place where you go and get stoned. Uh, um, <laughs> But it's, uh, uh, it's son, okay? Now, the son, words, son, and Daleth means door, way in. So now let me ask you something. John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right in the beginning, God gives us something that says the way in is the son. And he gives us a list of things. And I want, you to do, I want you to see this very nice little slide that I've prepared for you. Because from the Ten Commandments, the Magnificent Ten, we go and we get grace. Isn't that a beautiful photo? I found it. I said, I'm going to have to use it somewhere. I'm going to have to use it. So anyway, you are... You are getting to see it. So, grace is drawn out of what the world, what religion, what sadly most of the church has always looked as a list of to-dos in order to please. And the Ten Commandments have never been a list of things to do in order to please. And I'm going to show you now. They've never been something that would establish a relationship why? Because their relationship was established already. <laughs> you don't have to do anything but accept the fact that I am the Lord, your God. Amen. 
That's it. That's why when Jesus comes back in the book of Revelation, he says, it doesn't say, will he find people that obey the Ten Commandments? Will he find church that listen to what the latest the Revelation says? Will he find, no, he says, will he find faith? Why? Because all that is required of you is believe what he has already done. And religion will always point and say, do. And grace will always point away and say, done. And that's what you need to understand. Now watch. Uh, the first part of this magnificent thing is, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. Notice it doesn't say, I will be. Notice it makes a statement. It doesn't, it's not a condition. It's not a, it's not a, if you, I will. No, it says, I am Jehovah Elohim. And amazingly enough, when, when, when God introduced himself to Moses, he introduced himself as Jehovah. But when he introduced himself to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and then in 17, when he did the covenant with the smoking furnace and the, and the smoke and the fire with himself and Abraham cut the, 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 the animals and then the, 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 the fire walked through. The, he introduced himself as El Shaddai. El Shaddai, the all-powerful one. The one unto whom... Everything is possible. Who can do everything. And then Israel went into slavery. And for 430 years, they knew El Shaddai that was not almighty. And how many of you realize that uh, I... I I watch, I watch some, some Christian television. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in Italy, I'm on TBN in Italy, but I watch some Christian television. And I always find the projection of something that is required from me. So I, there's always this picture of a God who can do it, who can do it all uh, as long as I can do something. Is that right? You've you got to confess something. You've got you to do this. You've got to give that. You've got to go there. You've got you to... Somewhere along the line, there's something that you need to do so that El Shaddai can... Poof, blast into your life and give you a parking spot or heal you of a terminal disease. Because El Shaddai is the almighty one. But when, when God appears to Moses, and Moses says, uh, okay, let me, let me get this straight. Okay, you want me to go? Okay, first of all, it's very weird because I'm talking to a bush. Okay? So that's very weird. On top of it, it's bush that it's burning, but it's not burning. So this is very weird, and I'm very embarrassed and confused at this point in time. But let's assume that you are God. Remember when you spoke to A.B. and you told him, I'm El Shaddai, the almighty God. Well, that was like 700 years ago. And last time I checked, most of those years were a serious mess, including 430 years enslaved. By the people of Egypt. So who do you want me to tell? Those who have believed El Shaddai for 430 years and they still shackled. And they still slaves. And they still dying by the hand of their masters. How do you want me to introduce you? What do you want me to tell them? Who should I say you are? And suddenly God introduces himself with his covenant name. He says, tell him, Jehovah sent you. 
And in that understanding, when God removes himself from the powerful God to the covenant God, in that understanding is the key to a packed life. If you go to El Shaddai because of what he can do for you, somewhere along the line, let me tell you, I've been a few years in ministry. And I've been a few years on this earth. Let me tell you, if you go to God for what he can do for you, sooner or later, you'll be disappointed. But if you go to God for who he is, your life will be jammed, crammed, packed with quality, with greatness, with beauty, and with provision. He says, I am the Lord of God. I am. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Okay, you remember that. The, how did they come out of Egypt? They came out of Egypt with a beautiful shadow. I've written a book called Shadow Land. On all the shadows of, the, of Christ in the Old Testament. And this is one of the most powerful ones. When God instructs Moses. And that's another very weird thing. For, for 500 years, half a millennia. God doesn't say a word to Israel enslaved in Egypt. And after 500 years, he shows up and he says, okay, let's have lunch. <clears throat> or supper. <laughs> that sometimes, I just, I just stand back and I say, God, you know, I, I, <laughs> let's have supper. After 500 years of slavery, let's have supper. Is that all you have to say? No, but it's a special supper. What you're going to do is you're going to kill a lamb. And we all know the story. You take a branch of hyssop. Hyssop is a figure, is a shadow of faith because it's a little uh, uh, bush that grows from, the, from, from walls where there is no soil. It draws the soil that it needs from the air. It's a picture of faith. And it draws, take, take the branch of hyssop, dip it in the blood of the lamb, and it has to be a particular lamb taken from the goats, some from the sheep. But it must be one year old and it must be blameless and then all those things. And then paint the doorposts of your house. And I, I wonder, I, I, I think two things. Number one, I think that some Egyptians believed that. And they hid behind that blood and they were spared. Now, how do I know that? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, and later on, it says that there were multitudes that lived. And that multitudes is the word goyim, which means different races. So, when, the, when Israel left Egypt, in, in the congregation, there were, there were Egyptians. There were non-Jews. Why? Because you are saved by the blood. Not by your nationality. Anyway, let's leave it like that. And uh, so, and I am quite, now I, I cannot prove this, but I'm quite, I think that some Jews lost their firstborn. Because I don't think all of them believed it. Okay, Moses run that by me again. 430 years slaves. And you want me to do what? You want me to nuke Egypt. You want me to sneak up and kill Pharaoh. You want me to invent the Uzi machine gun. And No, no, I want you to take some blood and paint the front of your door with it. And this Al Shaddai that didn't show up for 500 years, this Al Shaddai, he's going to save me. He said, no, 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 wait a minute. He has introduced himself as Jehovah, the God of covenant, the God of pact, the God of grace. And that's why it's going to work. And then he says, who brought you out of the land of Egypt? He says, you remember how they got out of the land of Egypt? They came out by the blood, right? 
So now when God speaks these words in Sinai, after the exodus, after the blood, after the crossing of the Red Sea, on the other side, on the Sinai Peninsula, when God speaks on the mountain and speak, gives these words from Moses, were they free or not? They were saved, weren't they? They were saved. They didn't need the Ten Commandments to be saved. You know what they needed the Ten Commandments for? To start living again. Not as slaves, but as human beings. Because all their lives they'd been crammed in their head that if you want something, you take it. If you want a woman, you rape her. If you want to get out of trouble, you lie. There are hundreds and millions and thousands of different gods that you can worship. This Al Shaddai guy, forget about it. Make yourself a calf. Worship the Sumerian gods. Worship the Egyptians god. And so there had to be a code. A renewing of the mind. The Romans, we heard it this morning. Romans speaks of the Romans. Paul speaks in the book of Romans, in the letter to the Romans, chapter 12. And he says, you need to have your mind renewed. Why? Because you're stuck with the thing that says you're a slave. You've got to do something in order to produce results. When God shows up and he says, just follow me. Just trust me. Just believe me. And I will give you a life crammed with beauty and with power. Okay, so now. This is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before you. We covered it last time. The second one says you shall not make for yourself a carved image and any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. And of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, right there, some people will say, now, you see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. In order to be blessed, you need to keep the commandments. And otherwise, he's going to visit you, your children, your grandchildren, and so on. We haven't got time this morning to talk about it, but trust me, when he says, I will visit two generations, and I will bless a thousand, he's not talking about whether you keep the Ten Commandments or not. He's talking about the fact that you believe who he is and you trust him or not. Now watch. The next one. Remember, I'm your father. And the only re this, is my, this is my personal translation of the Ten Commandments, okay? We'll, uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a list later on. But sometimes we, we get so convoluted around these, these concepts, religious concepts, that, that it gets confused. It gets, I'm a simple person, okay? And, and, and I like simple things. Now, when he says, don't make yourself idols, you must understand that I, I, I was born in Italy, and boy, <laughs> you know, if you think about building yourself idols, we are the masters, okay? We can make idols. I can assure you, we can make idols. We got big Marys, little Marys, fat friars, thin friars, short monks, Big monks dressed in black, dressed in brown, with beards, without beards, with hair, without hair, uh, with, uh, you know, but we've we got idols to the point where even Jesus has is, is got his big heart on a wall with a cross on it and, it, and it's ridiculous. It's pathetic. So, yes, it's also talking about the fact that you mustn't make idols, but how many of you have got a Buddha in your house? Don't put your hand up, I'll come and cast a demon out of you. <laughs> But, okay, no, there's something inside of you that will go, nah. huh? I mean, we live in Africa, right? And, and, and we got masks and we got busts and statues and things. And, and there's, there's, some of them are okay. Some of them, you know, but there are some that we go, whoa. <laughs> I never forget the one time I bought a, I bought a, 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 a Shongololo, what, what do you call it? 
Um, <laughs> what do you call that thing? Uh, um, muti, mutimu, mutimu. Uh, from, uh, from Rwanda. I, I went up to see the gorillas and do other stuff. None of your business. And I, I, bought, a, I bought a statue, a wooden statue of this idol of this African idol that sits there with his big bulbous eyes with a slit and a book on his head. Now, I don't know why he's got a book on his head, but he's got a book on his head. So, uh, I came, then, of course, we came to Hermanus. This was 1983. We came to Hermanus. We got the house in, uh, in Honrus, and, and we put out the stuff. And one night, I've got the fire going, and I walk past this thing, and man, I tell you, this thing just looked at me. Huh? You know what I'm talking about? He just looked at me. And he said, just go to bed and I'll eat your toes off. And I thought, no, you don't. And I took it and I threw it in the fire. <laughs> you are looking at the very domesticated Mario. But I used to be a heaven of a lot more radical than what I am now. Anyway, uh, so he went in the fire, and it didn't last 10 minutes. And the fire had eaten from behind, and the front was, was solid, but the slits in the eye had been eaten by the fire, and I looked, and this thing was in the fire, totally complete, and the fire, it was looking at me through the, through the slit in the eye, and hating me. And I said, I said, tough luck, burn. <laughs> you. In the name of Jesus, just to, <laughs> just, just to be sure. But so, so you see, it, it's, not, it's not really, yes, it's the idol, yes, the, Okay, so if you want the, the summary of this message, don't buy Buddhas, okay? Don't, don't, don't put Mother Mary's in the, in the, in the passage and, the, you know, that kind of stuff. Do you know the story of the, 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 the son of the mafia boss? They wanted a, they wanted a bicycle. And he writes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I'd like a bicycle. Comes his birthday and no bicycle. So for Christmas, he writes again. He says, Jesus, I'd like a bicycle. He comes Christmas, no bicycle. So he goes into the passage in his, father's, in his house, and he grabs the little statue of Mary at the end of the passage, he wraps it up in a towel, puts it in his drawer, and writes another letter. If you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> so. So. So if you want the simplicity of the second commandment, okay, sure, don't, don't have idols. But is, is that all that he's talking about? I don't think so. I think what it says, it says this. <laughs> See, the Ten Commandments is basically a marriage proposal. It says, I'm the Lord your God. And, 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 and you're my bride. Come on, Jerusalem, Israel is the bride of, of Jehovah throughout the Old Testament, and as the church is the bride of Christ. So there's this relationship, there's this covenant betrothal type of offering, and he says, and he says okay, now look, uh, we, I want to marry you, but let's establish some rules. Some, if, if we're going to get married, don't carry the pictures of your old boyfriends in your pocket, in, in your purse. Don't carry a picture of your old flames with you. And uh, <laughs> because basically, I want to be enough for you. He says, don't make yourself idols. Don't See, yes, there's Buddha, and yes, there's, 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 there's Kali, and yes, there's Mother Mary, and Uncle John, and you know, all those things. Y yes. Sure, but, but then there's cars and children and appearance and uh, ministry. 
Ah, oh, come on, Mario. Communists should be an idol. <laughs> I tell you something. I have seen more, well, not more marriages, I'm going to say that. But I've seen so many marriages destroyed by ministry. Because people commit adultery with the bride of Christ. They spend more time with a woman that doesn't belong to them than with theirs, with their bride. It can be an idol. Yes, it can be an idol. And idols can be a whole bunch of stuff. And, and God is saying, don't carry around pictures of your old flames with you. Please, if you're going to get married, and if you want a special life from me, don't do that. And I want to illustrate this from an incident that took place in the book of Mark, chapter 10, and verses 17 through 21. And this is what it says. It says, Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, can you see immediately where the, where the focus is? I've got to do something. Right? And I'm telling you, it hasn't changed for thousands of years. If I, if I, I cannot do that. But if I were to come through this congregation, I will find 99% of you still thinking that in order to be accepted by God, you have to do something. And that the reason why your latest prayer wasn't answered is because you didn't do it. Or maybe you didn't do it well enough. Or maybe you didn't do it intensely enough. Somewhere along the line, you didn't perform up to standard. And so this rich ruler shows up and he says, uh, um, what must I do that, my inherit, that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Isn't that the key? Isn't that the key to the whole thing? Like Jesus is simply saying to him, just trust me. If you realize that I am that Jehovah incarnate, that, that God who made covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is now abiding within this body, then we can go, we can go places. And then he says... You know the commandments. Why? Because the guy wants to know, what must I do? So Jesus replies according to what you want. That's why, my friends, it's so vital that you understand grace. Yes, amen. Because if you go to God with the law, that's what you're going to get. That's a very simple explanation to that very difficult passage when he says, you're forgiven of everything. But if you don't forgive your brother, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. Ouch! Did it ever go ouch to you? Come on, be honest with me. The, the, if, if it didn't, it's because you don't read the Bible properly. If you don't forgive, don't put your hand up. How many of you are holding grudges against somebody? You're going to hell. You're going to hell. The Bible says the father is not going to forgive you either. You need to understand grace. If you don't understand grace, you're stuck with that kind of scripture. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mania. Come and pray. Come and preach to you. Come and preach to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amen. So, watch. So he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Do not defraud. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm reading. And honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. In other words, I've done it all. All that you asked me to do, I've done it. And I still don't have satisfaction. I still don't have fulfillment. I still don't have that promise of life abundant that you have given me. And again, don't put your hand up, but I can, I know it. I can come through this congregation and most of the congregations all over the world and pick one by one and say, are you living 
a fully crammed, totally joyful, happy, satisfied, fulfilled life. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, you will say, no. I don't have enough money. I'm not married. I am married. Uh, too long. I'm too short. I'm married to the wrong guy. I'm married... Someone else is married to the right guy. <laughs> uh, I'd like to be married to the right guy. You know, there's always something that, uh, there's this that hurts, and there's that that hurts, and there's this one that hurt me, and there's that one that insulted me. And if I would, I don't have the right job, I live in the wrong country, I'm in the wrong skin color, I'm the right skin color, from the other point of view, I'm this and that and the other. I, somewhere along the line, that abundant life eludes you, escapes you. If you don't understand what he's talking about. He answered and said to him, Teacher, I've done all these things from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Oh man, I tell you, that is so beautiful. Even in his mistake, even in his wrong approach to Messiah, Jesus looks at him and he loves him. You know what? You can be in the midst of sin this morning. If you were to bump into Jesus, he'd look at you and love you. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you're serving the, that other God. The one that we don't talk about, right? That other one. And then he says, one thing you lack. <laughs> but no, no, whoa, whoa, time out. Jesus, come here. Peter, make a cup of coffee. One... One, you gave this guy six commandments, and last time I checked, there are ten. Now you do the math, Jesus. Ten minus six, it's not one. And it's interesting to note that Jesus quotes certain commandments. Have you noticed which commandments he quotes? The horizontal ones. The ones that you do with your brother and sister. It doesn't say anything about Sabbath, about don't make idols, about I am the Lord your God, and about don't use my name in vain. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Don't always, don't ever read the Bible, just the words. The words mean nothing. Jesus didn't come to earth and turn into paper. The word became flesh. Amen. And flesh speaks. It's the spirit of the word that must speak to you. So, he says, uh, uh, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, take up the cross and follow me. What is he saying? He's saying, all that stuff doesn't count, doesn't serve any purpose. I have come to fulfill, I loosed you from the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophet. Now, you want to do the law and the prophet? You can do it. You can only do six out of ten. But you can do it. But you want fulfillment? Drop everything. Throw away the, the photos of your old flames, of your old idols, of the things that have given you the idea of fulfillment in your life. And follow me. And I can assure you, I will. And I'm not talking about fulfillment Ooh, I woke up in a good mood this morning. Hallelujah. And the angels are singing. No, I'm talking about stuff. I'm talking about being able to survive. I'm talking about having a reasonable, healthy body. I'm talking about relationship. I'm talking about a smile on your face. I'm talking about children that don't burn out the high school. I'm talking about uh, a cat that doesn't eat the fish, and a dog that doesn't eat the cat, and the fridge that fridges, and the stoves that stoves, and the car that cars. I'm talking about life and life. More 
abundant. But if you go for the stuff, Jesus says, you want to do the commandments? Be my guest. Religion will always lack one thing. Relationship. Vertical relationship. The four commandments that you cannot fulfill. No matter what you try. In fact, the more you try to fulfill them, and the more. How many of you have ever tried to love somebody? And I'm not talking about a decision to forgive, to accept. I'm talking about generating that thing inside. I talked to some of the youngsters here. I'm sure that uh, they have already, in their short life... <laughs> Uh, I've, always be, I've always wanted to say that, you know. I needed to get to 67 to say that, you know. It, it gives you, gives you, like seniority, you know. Like I'm, I'm standing in, I'm able to say that, you know. Uh, so in your young life, um, I'm sure that you. Well, let's talk about me. Uh, many years before I met my wife, which was 45 magnificent love-filled years ago, Amen. I used to have lots of girlfriends. And, uh, and when I was very young, I remember the only one that dropped me. <laughs> I tried everything to get her to love me. Have you ever, has anybody ever dropped you and you tried everything? He's smiling, okay. I, I got one. The rest of you, you are so British here. Yeah, no. no. Let's have some tea, my dear. <laughs> now, why? Because you cannot create love. That's why we are in the mess that we are, because we are free to hate. And God could only make us free to hate in order to make us free to love. And because we are free to hate... We are free to move away from him. And so, he said, but, 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 but the man, the young ruler, was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, let me give you Mario's translation. Can I give you Mario's translation? Go. And it says this. It says, And he answered and said to him, Lord, I want to spend my life with you. Then Jesus smiled at him and said, one thing you need to, to do, get rid of all your old flames and come, let's get married. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had many girlfriends. <laughs> That's my translation. Maybe it's not the literal translation, but hey, it gives you the, the idea. And my point, and I close with this, my point is this. If heaven and hell was not the issue. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. And the, and the, and the young ruler left Jesus and in the background, the music started. <laughs> no more. Okay, now, I bet, <laughs> I bet you you've never been in the church where they play the Rolling Stones, okay? But hey... I mean, Mick Jagger is almost as old as Moses anyway, so... <laughs> so. But he, he walked away singing that song. Why? Because unless you understand what he came to do, you always have a beehive-packed suitcase with lots of space to be filled. Somewhere along the line, there won't be that jam-packed 
life that gets you up in the morning and you go, you know what? It might not be exactly the way I want it, but Jesus, I love you, amen. And I know my life is in your hands and somewhere along the line you're in control and I trust you and I didn't give my life to Satan and I didn't give my life to any idols. I, in fact, I destroyed all the pictures of my old girlfriends and you and I are in love and I know that you're looking after me. And I know the bottom line, your decision, is what I want for my life. Amen. So, now we can go to the last frame. That says, if heaven and hell was not the issue. If you could go to heaven without Jesus, and you can't. Contrary to what some churches in America are stating. You cannot go to heaven by believing in Muhammad. Or blowing yourself up. Forgive me, I am not very diplomatically inclined. Okay? He is a son of uh, Allah, and Allah is Satan. Okay? Yeah. So, can, is that... I uh, know, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, non-diplomatic, but hey, tough luck, eh? I only get to preach once a month, so they... <laughs> okay, so... So, no, if you could go to heaven without Jesus, but you can't, would you still follow him? If you were not part, if your church was not a great church full of uh, uh, programs and beautiful people and with incredibly anointed pastors, uh, and, and, uh, and <laughs> yeah, you're talking about him, man. I know you. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, and all the same, would you still follow Jesus? If healing and prosperity and all the beautiful stuff was not an issue with you. In other words, you're prosperous and you're healed. Would you still follow him? Have you come to the point where you are convinced 100% that following Christ is the only way to abundant life? Because if you haven't, you're in for some serious disappointments. Some serious disappointments. But if you have, he will never, ever, ever leave you. Ever forsake you. Have you come to the point where you realize that turning you out of cheek is the right thing to do? That when somebody hurts you, the best avenue is to forgive them. Have you come to that point? Have you come to the point where that photograph of retaliation, that image of vengeance, that thing that said, angry, strike back. Have you tore up that thing? And have you now decided, I will follow Jesus? I will tear up the photo of my idol and I will forgive. Why? Because he said so. But you don't know what they did to me. Then forget about abundant life. Have you come to the point where you honestly and really realize and believe that the only way to receiving is giving? Or is it just a, a slogan? It's just something that you say when somebody invites you to bring an offering. Brother, good measure, shake down. Good measure, uh, what? Press down, press down. Shaken together, running over. Have you come to the point where you have Put your life in Jesus' hands. And you have decided to follow him with the best of your ability. And with the understanding that you're going to make mistakes. But if you make him in the right heart, he's there to pick up the pieces. And to put them all back together. And to give you back that suitcase, crammed, jammed 
with life. Because if you haven't, then we have a problem. But I want to encourage you this morning to do just that. To think, what are the things that are still sitting in your purse? What are those photographs that every now and then you pull out and you look and you check? Oh, you know what? Wow. This, yeah. I should actually, that, that was good. That was very good. And maybe it's time for you this morning to take some of the stuff with the hands of your spirit, with the imagination of your mind, and reach into your heart and get all those pictures. All those idols that somewhere along the line block you from receiving the fullness of what God has for you. Not because you obey Him, but because you follow Him. Amen. Stand with me, please. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Two things. Number one. The purpose of my life is to give you the good news. To give you the Ewagelion. The gospel of the good news. That your sins have been forgiven. Say, my Mary, I didn't ask forgiveness. I didn't ask you to ask forgiveness. I'm making a statement. I'm telling you, your sins have been forgiven you. Christ died on the cross and he paid the price required by the divine justice for sin to be paid for. His blood did it. Not your confession. Not your repentance. What you do is you accept what His blood has done. And then a whole flood of spiritual revolution begins to happen inside your heart. And suddenly you begin to focus on the stuff that is not right. You begin to see things. You begin to follow the, the voice of the shepherd. You begin to be led. You begin to be helped. So, can I ask you this morning, please, everybody, if, if just for, enough, for a moment of of intimacy with the Spirit. Would you close your eyes? Would you just bow your heads? And give a moment of intimacy with someone that maybe might be here this morning and he's struggling and he's saying, but you know what? I never heard this. I've always heard that I need to change. I need to obey the Ten Commandments. I need to do this. I need to do that. Well, let me tell you something. You need to do nothing. You need to accept everything that He has done. That's what you need to do. And then the change starts. And then the revolution begins. And then you will be able to sing, I get so much satisfaction in my life. So while every eye is closed and every head is bowed this morning, if you say to me, Mario, I would like you to pray for me. Because I want to do this. And even if I don't understand at all, I feel that, if I were to die now, I'm not so certain where I'm going. And I want to be certain. And just one word can make you certain. Just the word, thank you, Lord. Just the way I recognize what you've done, Jesus, and I receive it. Thank you, Lord. If you are here this morning and you are not certain, if you were to die in the next five seconds of where you're going, and you want me to pray with you, I'm going to pray and I'm going to include you in a prayer. Just shoot up your hand. Just put up your hand. Anybody here? Put up your hand. You want me to pray for you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody else? Thank you, Father. One, two, three. Anybody else? Put up your hand. Put up your hand. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Angels are rejoicing in heaven. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You said, but wait a minute. Is that all I must do? Well, you know, my prayer or your prayer is not going to save you. Christ has saved you. All you have to do is just say, thank you. Let me 
repent. Let me turn around from my way of thinking and go this way. Go the way that Jesus did it all. And I have to receive from Him. And that repentance will change your life. Last time, anybody else? You want me to pray for you? I want, you want me to include you in your prayer? And with three hands, anybody else? Thank you, Father. And another one. Hallelujah. Okay, let's all pray together. Let's all say this. Would you all help me, please, and the, those beautiful people that have lifted their hands? Say this with me. Say, God Almighty, I come to you in Jesus' name. I recognize the work of the cross. He paid for me. I receive it. I receive your pardon. I receive your forgiveness. I receive eternal life. And right now, I call on your name, Jesus. And I say thank you for what you've done. I take it in my life. And I ask you to fill my life with your presence, with your life. In Jesus' name, I thank you. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah. Uh, those people that have put up their hands, uh, if I can ask you to be so bold just to come as we have some time together of fellowship, would you come to the front, please? There's somebody that wants to talk to you and we pray with you. Would you do that for me, please? Thank you, Father. In the meantime, God bless you. Have some coffee. And, rem and remember the two-minute rule. You speak to someone you don't know for two minutes before you have coffee. At the back, they don't give them coffee unless they've had two minutes. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.